Now let us stand and sing hymn 401, The Church's One Foundation. Join me in the call to worship. Come, let us worship Almighty God. Let us lift up our songs, our prayers, our praises. Come, let us honor Christ Jesus. Let us love Christ with our hearts, our minds, our spirits. Come, let us be filled with the Spirit of the Living God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we trust in you and in your word completely. We praise you and honor you for the gift of eternal life made possible for us by the death of your only son for our sins. We down, bow down before him, Jesus Christ, the one you raised from the dead. We offer up our prayers to you through the one seated at your right hand in glory. We know that we can depend on your saving presence each day of our lives, for Jesus Christ intercedes for us daily. Fill us now with your Holy Spirit, so our worship and praise will be acceptable in your sight. 
even as we pray using the words Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So in Sunday school this year, um, before Sunday school class each week, we've been talking about the Lord's Prayer. Right, guys? Remember that? Maybe. Are you awake? Yeah? Okay, so we've been talking about the Lord's Prayer, and um, now we're going to talk about one of the lines in the Lord's Prayer, which is, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do you guys know what trespasses are? No, it's a big word, right? Um, trespasses are is another word for sins okay and so sins are things that we that we do wrong okay and so that part of the Lord's Prayer is saying um, forgive us of the things we do wrong as we also forgive people who do wrong things to us okay so that's what we're going to talk about today so Carly is my assistant today here so you ready all right, you want to hold up our first sign? What's our first point today? Why we forgive. Why we forgive. So, why we forgive, it's right in the Lord's Prayer. So it says, forgive us our trespasses or our sins or the things we do wrong um, as we forgive those who do wrong things against us. So we forgive because God forgives us. Okay, so God forgives all of the things that we do wrong, no matter how bad they are. And because of that, we need to show that love to other people, too, and forgive them. All right. What's our next one? Who we forgive. Who we forgive. Who do you guys think we forgive? Who should we forgive? God? Well, I don't think we need to forgive God. God forgives us, right? So we don't need to forgive God. He doesn't do anything wrong. God is perfect. But um, who, who do we forgive? Who, who should we forgive? If someone's mean to you, do you think you should forgive them? Yeah? Yeah, we should definitely forgive them. If your brother or sister does something you don't like, should we forgive them? Yeah, exactly. What if it's someone that you don't know very well? Should you still forgive them? Yeah. So we should forgive everyone. God forgives everyone, and we should forgive everyone too. Okay? And... Do you think that we should only forgive them once? If they just have one chance and then we don't have to forgive them anymore? What do you think? No, no, we need to forgive them again, even if they do something else bad, right? So we need to remember to forgive everyone and we need to forgive them as many times as they need. Okay? All right, what's our next one, Carly? How we forgive. How we forgive. This is the tough part. Do you think forgiving people is easy? I don't think so. No, it's definitely really hard sometimes. Especially, what if someone doesn't say sorry? What? Sometimes it's not easy, no. Sometimes it can be really hard, right? Yeah. Especially if that person maybe doesn't say they're sorry, then that makes it even harder, right? But we still need to forgive them. So there's some ways that we can, um, some things that can make forgiving people a little bit easier though. Can you think of anything that might help? What do you think? (laughs) 
Do you think that God will help us forgive people? Yeah, we can ask God. That's probably the best way, right? So we can pray to God and ask him to help us forgive people. Yeah, God doesn't like it when people hurt each other, right? <laughs> he puts them in time out. <laughs> All right, well, we could definitely ask God to help us um, forgive each other, right? Because God doesn't like when people are mean to each other either. And he also really likes it when people forgive each other, okay? Because he's forgiving us and we need to forgive other people. So that's probably the best way to, um, to make forgiving people a little bit easier. Um, you can ask God to help you with your hurt feelings because it doesn't feel good to have bad things happen to you, right? So you can ask God to make you feel better and then that can also help with um, forgiving people. So we also have to remember that that forgiving people is something that we have to do, right? And it's not saying that what they did is okay, um, but it's letting them it's it's letting them go anyway, okay? And it's letting them get set free, and that also lets you get set free, which brings us into our next part, which is our last question here. This is important. What if we don't forgive? What if we don't forgive? Do you think anything happens if we don't forgive each other? They get sad, yeah, and we get sad too, right? So if, if someone did something and God gets upset too, yeah. So if we don't forgive someone, then we're just keeping all those bad feelings inside of us, right? And that's not good. We want to get rid of those bad feelings. We want to let those bad feelings go. So if we don't forgive, our hearts become hard. That's what the Bible says. And so we want to make sure our hearts are not hard. And that's another thing we can ask God to help us with. Okay, and... Um, we, if we don't forgive people, then we might be not friendly to them anymore. Um, it might make it harder to be friends with those people, right? But if we forgive them, then we can let it go. And like I said before, then you let them be free, and you're also free because you're not keeping those bad feelings against them, okay? All right. So do you guys want to bow your heads and we'll say a little prayer really fast? Real quick, okay. All right. Dear Lord, thank you for, give it, for forgiving us of all of the things that we do wrong. We ask that you help us to also forgive people when they do wrong things towards us. Help us to have happy hearts and kind hearts towards others so that we can forgive them always. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you guys. Now remain seated as we sing hymn number 399, We Are God's People. Let's turn our hearts to prayer. Lord God, we have no words adequate to the task of expressing how blessed we feel this day as we come together for worship. We look around us and see sisters and brothers, people who share our faith and who have shared our joys and sorrows. 
We look at the cross and see a symbol of your commitment to our salvation and your amazing grace. We look in the Bible and see that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that you search for us when we are lost, and that you celebrate with the angels when we are found. Help us, Lord, find ways to express our gratitude to you and to others. Help us bless the world with our words and deeds. Help us to share the gospel of your love and welcome those who respond to it. Lord Jesus, when you walked on the dusty roads or sat by the glistening waters, you met people where they were. When you bent down low to touch the leper or raised your eyes to touch Zacchaeus' heart, heaven and earth were met. We ask that you be with the deacons as they search for an interim pastor. And we ask that you be with the search committee as they do their job to look where we want to go and then to seek a pastor who can fill our needs. Lord, we, we give, us, give us faith that no matter what our circumstances, know that we can turn to you and that you will always be there for us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
pray. Lord, you provide us with everything it is that we need. You have blessed us with many opportunities to do what is right and true. Teach us to become a blessing to others, even to those we do not know. Encourage us to follow the footsteps of your son, Jesus Christ, as he was the ultimate example of what a good person is. May these tithes and other gifts multiply, and may they be used to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Join with me in singing hymn number 681, In His Time, and remain seated. Today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, then chapters, I mean, um, verses 12, 21 through 26. It can be found in the Pew Bibles on page 1691. Matthias chosen to replace Judas. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, 
and Simon the, the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. Therefore, it is necessary to, to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So, so they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show, show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the apostol apostolic ministry, which Jesus left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. This ends the reading. To God be the glory, great things he has done. That was the theme of last Sunday's service when we said goodbye to Pastor Bob and Laura. And now today we start a new era, uh, a start a period of time in transition. And today's passage that Dave just wrote, uh, read to us is a passage of in transition. Let me give you a uh, setup for this story. Let's set the stage. The disciples were on the Mount of Olives and they had just witnessed the ascension of Jesus into heaven. Forty days prior to this, Jesus rose from the dead on that first Easter. The number 40 is a significant and important number in the Bible. It is a number of transition, whether it be 40 days, 40 weeks, or 40 years. Now, I'm not suggesting that any of these periods of time are going to be the periods of time uh, that we as a congregation are going to be in transition. 40 days certainly would be fantastic, right? Uh, 40 weeks would be nice. Uh, I don't even want to go to 40 years. First of all, I'll be 106. The period of 40 years or 40 days was a period of uncertainty, trial, finding out what God's will was for the family of God. And in all of these cases in the Bible, these periods of transition are followed by a blessing. Now there are many, and I'll just highlight a few of them, in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, we have the account of Noah and the flood. And of course, we know that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, that was a transition period between an old age, which Peter in his second letter, the third chapter, calls the age that was then, and leading to a new age that Peter called the age that is now. The blessing that followed the flood uh, that wiped out all human life and animal life, in fact, other than the last remnant of God's family that existed, which was Noah and his family and the animals that God had sent to him to put into the ark. 
The blessing that followed was the covenant that God had made with Noah that no more would there be a great flood that would wipe out entire uh, mankind. And that covenant was ratified and sealed by God with the sign of a rainbow. Another example of this transition period of 40 was the transition of the 40 years that the family of God, the Israelites, spent wandering in the wilderness after God had led them out of the land of Egypt where they were in captivity for 430 years. Uh, they wandered through the wilderness uh, in transition, looking for God's will, and the blessing was their entering the promised land. There are many, many other examples in the book of Judges and in the prophets of, of this transition period of 40 years or weeks or days. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, we have Jesus being baptized, and then he takes a transition period of 40 days where he goes into the wilderness and he fasts and is tempted uh, by Satan. And the blessing is that he was victorious over Satan in that he uh, did not succumb to any of the temptations of Satan. Uh, and then he started his uh, three-year ministry where he started to gather his new family, the family of Jesus Christ, in the disciples and his other followers. And then just before this story, as I said, we had the 40 days uh, between the ascension of Jesus and going back to his resurrection. And in that 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples, teaching them, and he also appeared to his own family, Mary, and his brothers. And uh, Paul tells us in uh, the 1 Corinthians the 15th chapter that Jesus appeared to as many as 500 at one time uh, as the risen Savior. So now we have the setup to this story. Jesus has just ascended into heaven. He had given the disciples uh, a final instruction that they were to go to Jerusalem and stay there until the gift of the Holy Spirit that was promised would be uh, poured out upon them. And we know that was the day of Pentecost. And that would happen 10 days from this point. So we start out then in the 12th verse that says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. Um, they call them hills. They call them mountains. We would probably consider them mountains, but it was on a mountain ridge. The Mount of Olives is about 2,700 feet in elevation. And Jerusalem on Mount Zion is a little bit lower than that, just under 2,500 uh, feet, uh, but they seem much taller when you're in the general area because just 20 miles to the east is the Dead Sea, which lies about 1,500 feet below sea level. So they seem more like 4,000 foot mountains than uh, 25 or 2,700 foot mountains. And uh, so from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem, it says here, is a Sabbath day's walk. Uh, Sabbath day's walk was about three quarters of a mile. So it wasn't very far that they would walk from the Mount of Olives and come down and go through the Valley of Kindred and back up to uh, the city of Jerusalem. Now, because it says it's a Sabbath day walk doesn't mean that it was on the Sabbath that it was happening. Remember, it was 40 days after Easter, which was on a Sunday, so 40 days would have been a Friday. And in fact, when they use the term Sabbath here, uh, referring to the day of the week, they're still observing Saturday 
as the Sabbath day. It wasn't uh, until about 100 to 200 years after this that the early Christian church uh, moved from Saturday to Sunday to observe the Sabbath. So in verse 13 then it says, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Uh, some people have the idea this might have been the same room where they observed the uh, Last Supper, the upper room. But the uh, Greek here for upstairs and room is totally different from the Greek word used for the upper room for the uh, Last Supper. Uh, but it was evidently a room that they had been staying in during the uh, Passover season and uh, after the resurrection uh, while they were in the Jerusalem area. So they were staying there according to Jesus' command for them to stay. Now Luke gives us who was present there and he lists the names of the 11 uh, disciples that were there. Remember Judas wasn't there anymore after he had betrayed Jesus and realized that Jesus was going to be put to death he went out and killed himself. So there was a vacancy in the list of the disciples. Uh, and to the disciples, it was very important that they fill that list. Uh, the number 12 was important because it represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, so it was important that they um, get that filled. So. But present at, uh, in this room were the 11 disciples. And uh, at the end of verse 14, it says, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. These women, we're not really sure who they were. Um, we know throughout the Gospel of Luke, in many of the stories there, that uh, there's... Uh, information that tells us that women also followed Jesus around during his ministry and that they supported his ministry even with finances. It's also possible that some of these women might have been wives of some of the disciples. We know for sure that Peter was married because Jesus, we're told in the Gospels, that Jesus went into Peter's house and healed his mother-in-law. Uh, I'm not sure if Peter was really all that happy about that, but we won't go there. Uh, so we have these women. We have Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. His brothers had been very absent throughout his ministry and were led to believe that his brothers did not believe in Jesus until after the resurrection, Paul tells us in that 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians that Jesus did appear to his brother James um, after the resurrection. So what do we have here? We have the disciples and we have these women and we have Jesus' mother and brothers. What we have now is the start of God's new family uh, the start of the church of Jesus. And so for this 10-day period, the family of God stuck together. That's very important for us to realize, being in transition, uh, waiting for God to bring us a new pastor, it's very important for us to stick together as a family. We need to support one another. We need to encourage one another. Uh, we need to pray for one another. Uh, one of the great assets I see in this congregation is the fact that it is a church family and it's a very strong church family. The decision um, that made to come and be a part of this ministry for Sharon and I to come uh, was made very easy by the fact of the love that we experienced in the short period of time that we were here with you all. So what did the 
new family of God do in this room? Well, they stuck together. I'm sure that they talked a lot about Jesus' teachings. But here in verse 14, it says, They all joined together constantly in prayer. They prayed without ceasing. They prayed, I'm sure, for one another. They were in this transition period, so there was a lot of uncertainty. I'm sure they prayed uh, for God's will to be revealed to them. So prayer was of the utmost importance. Uh, In this period of transition for us, Prayer is the single most important thing that we continue to do, to pray for one another, to uh, pray for our leadership and for our search committee, which we, Nancy, just did a few moments ago. And in a few minutes, we're going to do more uh, formal way of uh, praying for those two groups. But we need to, again, uphold each other, encourage each other, and sustain each other through prayer. Now it goes on to say in verse 15, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. 120 was an important number uh, in the Jewish community since the exile to... uh, set up a community, uh, it was required that you had 120 uh, to start that community and to start a synagogue. Uh, Peter says uh, that the scriptures had to be fulfilled, that uh, Judas' place uh, as a disciple uh, had to be filled. Uh, It says in verse 17, he was one of our number and shared in this ministry. You see, the disciples uh, just didn't walk around and uh, listen to Jesus. Uh, They had specific jobs to do. They had specific ministries. Judas was like the treasurer of the disciples. He carried the money around. Uh, You think, oh boy, of all the people to carry and being in charge of the money, Judas, you know. Um, So it was important that they replace Judas and that opening in his ministry. If we move on to uh, uh, verse 21, it starts to outline what the parameters and what the qualifications for this replacement is going to be. And it says, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. Interesting that normally we think that the disciples were the only ones that were really with Jesus throughout his whole ministry, but there were many others. And one of the qualifications here is that uh, an individual had to been with Jesus throughout his entire ministry. That was so they could get the teachings and the understanding of uh, what uh, Jesus was preaching about. And that uh, it says here also that for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection, of Jesus' resurrection. So not only were they seeing and hearing Jesus uh, teach and preach, but they were an eyewitness to the resurrection. And all of this was for the sole purpose of fulfilling Uh, Jesus' final command, which was to go out to all nations, starting first in Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's important for us to continue that command here first, spreading the gospel, not just to Cliftondale, but to Saugus 
out to the North Shore and beyond. And it's important that it's the gospel of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it became evident that there was two men that met these qualifications that were with them. One was a fellow named Joseph, which is also known as Barsabas, also known as Justice. Um, sounds like he had some aliases here. And I don't know if he was in the legal, but uh, I will let that go. They did, in fact, have several names. There were Greek names and their Hebrew names, so they had multiple names. And then there was this fellow, Matthias. And both of these individuals met the qualifications uh, that were put forth. Then in verse 24, it tells us what they did next. Then they prayed. Here again, prayer is the central issue and the central most important thing that they can do. They prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen. They're asking the Lord to show them his will uh, to replace Judas here. Then it says in verse 26, they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11. Uh, what they would do is they would take a, uh, a jar, a piece of pottery, and they would take a couple of pebbles and mark the pebbles with the sign of each name. Maybe it was their initials, like M for Matthias. Um, in the case of Joseph, with all of his names, it would have been, uh, let's see, JBJ. If you're a Red Sox fan, that doesn't mean Jackie Bradley Jr. It's Joseph Barsabas Justice. And the idea we hear Peter probably being the lead disciple would take his hand and put it into the jar to pull out one of these pebbles. And it was their belief that Peter's hand would have been guided by God uh, to choose the pebble that of the person that God wanted. So it was in God's hands and it was God's will as to who was chosen, in this case, Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. So now in our period of transition, the things that we need to remember, we need to stick together as a family, support one another, encourage one another, Pray for one another. Prayer is essential uh, for us during this period of transition. Uh, we need to pray uh, for our selection committee, which we're going to do in a moment, uh, that they would know God's will. Uh, we need to pray for our deacons, uh, our leadership, who are making the important spiritual decisions for us. Uh, we need to pray for one another that we would be encouraging those that are in these committees. It's not an easy job. It requires a lot of time. And uh, it's very important on a daily basis that we pray for these uh, two groups. So I'm going to ask if those present that are on the search committee and who are deacons, if you would... Uh, join me down front, and I'm going to lead us all in, in a prayer of dedication of these committees and these people. I think we're approaching that number of 120. <laughs> uh, actually, this is uh, really encouraging when you look at uh, all these folks up here, uh, because getting people to be willing to do the work that they have to do is very difficult. I'm sure that Dave found that out in trying to uh, get the uh, committee together. Uh, but now you can put faces with your leadership and with this committee. Uh, that should help in making it easier to pray for them on a daily basis. Uh, we thank them for their willingness uh, to do this very difficult job. 
So uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give you all thanks and glory for this church, for the ministry that this church has in the community, for its faithfulness in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for uh, opening the hearts of all those up here uh, to serve us, uh, not only as deacons, but as members of the uh, search committee. Father, we pray that you would uh, pour out your Holy Spirit on them. Uh, give them wisdom, strength, encouragement, patience, and Lord, the willingness to open up their hearts and their minds to seek your will uh, in this process. Lord, pray for the congregation as a whole, that they would have patience, and that they would have wisdom, that they would encourage the committees uh, through prayer and through spoken word. Lord, we pray that uh, all this will be done uh, so that you would uh, do your will in bringing the person that you would have come and be our pastor. Lord, help us to be open-minded enough not to uh, look for someone that we personally feel uh, should be in for whatever qualifications that they have, but uh, reveal to us, Lord, your will in the direction that you would have this ministry here at Cliftondale go, and that uh, you would bring the one with the gifts and that is uh, most talented to fulfill the mission that you would have. Lord, we pray uh, specifically, though, that they would have a heart for the Lord Jesus, that they uh, have a heart for preaching the gospel uh, and taking that out into the community. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have done uh, give us strength and keep us together and encourage us. Pour your spirit out amongst us uh, that we'd be one in spirit and one in love of Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, and our Redeemer. Amen. And now let us stand and sing our final hymn, 426, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. pray. Lord Jesus, send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name. Amen.